you, thank you so much, Ricardo. I don't know, I can't see anyone, so I hope you can hear and see me okay. Ricardo, can you see my screen? All good? Yeah, yeah, yeah your presentation's on, and yes, we can hear Lovely. you. Go ahead, mate. Hello, welcome. Um, again, similar apologies to Bert in the sense that I don't speak um, Portuguese, but I'll do my best to go through this presentation at a good speed, um, keep things nice and simple, and also hope to share some of the work that I've been doing as part of my PhD. So, as Ricardo said, my talk today is the impact of exercise and the lack of on brain blood flow. Um, so I just wanted to start off with a little bit about me. So I'm a second year PhD student. I'm halfway through my PhD. Um, and my PhD is at the University of Exeter in England, so the same location that Bert pointed out, and also at the University of Queensland over in Brisbane, Australia. And this forms this, this QEX Institute. Um, so the QU for Queensland and the X for Exeter. Make sure I've got a laser pen. Um, Bert is my primary supervisor, so I feel like the order of these presentations are very much the master and then the apprentice, um, but we have a lot of overlap in the work that we're doing, um, and like it's halfway through my PhD. And in particular, my research interests, I'm a student in Exeter at the Children's Health and Exercise Research Centre, um, and this is a picture of me in the lab doing some research, and I'm particularly interested in cerebral blood flow regulation in children and adolescents, um, particularly during exercise. So. What we mean by cerebral blood flow, anytime we see the word cerebral, we're referring to the brain. And I'm interested in how that changes in children, adolescents and adults um, at rest and during exercise um, and how the regulation of that process also matures. So in terms of this lecture and this talk today, um, I'm not going to present the global problem of you know, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, physical inactivity. Instead, I'll refer you to Bert's presentation where he brilliantly summarised um, the global issues, almost the double pandemic that we're facing now. Um, instead, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to you about the human brain and why studying uh, brain blood flow is important. I'm then going to talk about brain blood flow specifically in children and some very important child-adult differences that we're seeing. I'm then going to talk on one side the positive effects of exercise and physical activity. And then on the flip side, what happens if we take that away and we undergo a period of physical inactivity? And that's where we'll draw on the current um, issues with quarantine from coronavirus. So cerebral blood flow. This is the human brain. So anytime you see cerebral blood flow, remember that means brain blood flow. And the brain is a very, very energetically demanding organ. So of our body weight, it's only about 2%. But 15% of our cardiac output, so 15% of our blood flow goes to the brain, although it weighs such a small amount of our body weight. So why is brain blood flow important? So it's important to deliver oxygen and fuel to the brain. And in terms of the brain, this is particularly important because the brain has a really limited capacity to store oxygen and to store fuel. So if you're familiar with your muscles, they'll have stores of glycogen. However, our brain doesn't store a lot of glycogen. And equally, we might have some, some myoglobin in our muscles where we can store oxygen, but we don't have this in the brain. So our brain relies very heavily on blood flow to deliver oxygen, fuel, and essential nutrients. This can sometimes be particularly important in the context of exercise, um, where we have competition for blood flow shown here in the working skeletal muscles, but also for the brain. So it's really important that the body has these processes in place to regulate the blood flow that's seen in the brain and in the muscles. So obviously there's implications if we have too little brain blood flow, we're gonna be starving the brain of these essential um, nutrients of oxygen. But also if we over perfuse the brain, so we feed it with too much blood, we can risk sort of hemorrhage and internal bleeding. So I guess the ultimate summary from this slide is that brain blood flow needs to be very tightly regulated in order for brain function and also whole body survival. So the regulation of cerebral blood flow, what are these processes in place in the human body that regulate blood flow to the brain? So like I said, the brain has to respond to many challenges. This, this could be in the form of exercise, this could be in the form of hypoxia, it could be in the form of flying, it could be in the form of disease or aging. Um, and it involves a complex interaction of lots of different mechanisms in order to try and keep it as constant as possible despite these changing environmental conditions. So one such factor is oxygen. So oxygen is obviously very important. I mentioned before, the brain doesn't store oxygen, so we're relying on brain blood flow to deliver it. If oxygen levels decrease, so if we're in a condition of hypoxia, we see a compensatory increase in cerebral blood flow to match the oxygen demand. Cardiac output is another example of a factor. So if we exercise and we increase our cardiac output or our heart rate, blood flow to the brain is going to increase. 
There are loads of different markers in the blood that can influence um, cerebral blood flow, and some of these include nitric oxide, which we know is a vasodilator. So Bert has mentioned it dilates the blood vessels, and that's the same for the vessels that feed the brain. Carbon dioxide is a really, really important regulator of brain blood flow. Might seem a little bit strange. Perhaps people think that oxygen is more important, but in terms of the brain, carbon dioxide is actually more important. And if we think about you know, our whole body, carbon dioxide is, is toxic. It lowers the pH and makes things more acidic. So if we have a high concentration of carbon dioxide, we're going to need to increase brain blood flow in order to wash it out because our brain doesn't like CO2. So if we have a high level of CO2, brain blood flow increases. And if we have a low level of CO2, brain blood flow decreases. If you have a hyperventilated very quickly, you're lowering your CO2 levels and that's why you feel really lightheaded. Uh, this diagram here is to represent cerebral metabolism, so sort of energy consumption within the brain, which obviously changes with things such as cognitive tasks or challenges. This represents blood pressure. So as our blood pressure increases, obviously blood flow to the brain is going to concurrently increase. And finally, this here represents sympathetic nerve activity. So we've got different nerve activations that can constrict and dilate the blood vessels that feed the brain and consequently increase or decrease blood flow. Typically, if you have an increased neural firing, that results in vasoconstriction and a reduction in brain blood flow. So I think the main thing I'd like you to appreciate from this slide is um, that there are a whole host of different factors that influence brain blood flow. And it's very rare in real life to encounter a situation where just one of these is changing. So before we go any further, let's talk about the anatomy of the cerebrovascular. Okay, so this is a person here and there are two main arteries um that feed the brain so we've got the internal carotid artery so if you ever felt your pulse in your neck you're feeling your pulse and your heart rate in your common carotid artery and that branches off into two so you've got the extracranial artery here that feeds your cheeks and your ears and helps with heat loss and the internal carotid artery goes into the brain and feeds the large portion inside the brain with its blood flow towards the back of the brain shown here you've got the vertebral artery and this feeds the posterior circulation so the back side of the brain and that's important for things such as the brainstem, where we find the respiratory centers. If we're looking inside of the brain now, so we've almost taken a, a cross section and we're looking down on top of the head like this, we have what we call the circle of Willis. And this is just to appreciate the, the complex anatomy that we find within all of our brains. And I'll tell you now, this isn't as circular in every individual, and there are, there are lots of individual differences. Um, and in fact, about one in 20 people or something don't have a complete circle of Willis. So if we locate similar arteries, we, here we can see the internal carotid artery that's coming up to feed the brain, and that feeds here the middle cerebral artery. So these arteries, the middle cerebral artery is your biggest intracranial. So extracranial means it's outside of the skull, those are the ones in your neck. Intracranial means it's inside of the brain, and the middle cerebral artery is fed by the internal carotid artery and is your main artery inside the brain. If we locate our vertebral artery towards, again, the back side of our brain, so our nose is going to be here, we're looking down on top. That feeds the posterior cerebral artery, which is the main intracranial vessel supplying the back of the brain. So basically, this is to appreciate a very complex anatomy, but we have our main extracranial vessels here that in turn feed the middle and the posterior cerebral arteries. So how do we measure cerebral blood flow? As a research scientist, there's lots of different options available to us. And the gold standard, the dream, is to use an MRI scanner. And what we can do is we can use lots of different techniques, such as um, arterial spin labeling, where we can locate um, the different perfusion levels in the different cross sections of the brain. Or we can do sort of blood oxygen level dependent MRI scanning, where we can locate the blood flow um, using an oxygen tracer in the white and gray matter of the brain. But obviously, this, this comes perhaps with significant costs or with relying on a hospital. So sometimes for research, it's not always the most convenient or most accessible way to measure cerebral blood flow. On top of that, I'm an exercise scientist. I'm interested in what happens during exercise. It's often quite a difficult setup to try and get someone to conduct some exercise in an MRI scanner. So what options are then available to us? So here's a picture of me lying on a bed in, in Queensland. And you can see here, just on the screen, we're using an ultrasound probe, like Bert mentioned. But this time we're not scanning the arteries in our arms. We're scanning the arteries in our neck. So that was the vertebral artery and the internal carotid artery. And what that allows us to do is capture this two-dimensional picture of the artery where we can measure the cross-sectional area or the diameter of the lumen of the artery. It also allows us to obtain a trace of its blood flow velocity. If we have a vessel's cross-sectional area and its blood flow velocity, we can calculate the total blood flow going to the brain in that vessel. 
This gives us a measure of global cerebral blood flow. Because if we add up the blood flow in the internal carotid artery, shown here, and the vertebral artery shown there, we've got the amount of brain, the amount of blood going to the brain. However, again, I'm having to lie down to have this scan done on me. It's, it's you know not a good option if I'm doing perhaps some hand grip exercise or some breathing challenges. But this is very very difficult to conduct if I'm on an exercise bike um, or doing, for example, treadmill running um, or cycling. So then the option available to us is shown here. This is um, a picture of myself and Alice, um, a colleague at Exeter. Um, and this piece of equipment here is a much smaller probe and it can be attached with a headset. This is called transcranial Doppler ultrasonography. So this is a transcranial Doppler probe, also called TCD for sure. And what that allows us to do is obtain the same measurement of flow velocity, but we don't get a measurement of the vessel diameter. So obviously this has massive strengths. It's attached with this headset and it can be locked in place on both sides of the brain. And I can squat, I can stand and I can do some cycling without our signal quality being affected. However, the main limitation of this approach is that we only get a measure of flow velocity, not of the actual blood flow to the brain. So remember I said we can calculate blood flow if we have the velocity and the area. Here we're only having the velocity. So velocity only remains an appropriate measurement of flow if the vessel diameter doesn't change. And here we're scanning the middle cerebral artery. So we're scanning one of the arteries in the brain. And evidence shows that across most physiological challenges we'll study, that the cross-sectional area of the artery doesn't change too much. So this tends to be an appropriate surrogate measure of blood flow in the brain. So a few technicalities there, I appreciate it. But we've gone from one end of the spectrum, really expensive, very limited movement permitted, to sort of this one here where we can still get a measure of global cerebral blood flow. And here we can measure blood flow velocity in the brain but it allows us to do it through a lot more different tasks. Okay, so just take this opportunity to go through some important terminology, just to make sure there's no confusions um, during, um, during the rest of the presentation. So cerebral blood flow, CBF, that means brain blood flow, um, and that is a measure of the blood flow going into the brain. However, how cerebral blood flow changes to different challenges has different terminologies. So one of these is cerebrovascular reactivity. So remember, Bert was talking about the reactivity of our peripheral vessels to respond to um, the hyperemic stress. We have a challenge in the brain where it's very reactive to changes in CO2. So as I mentioned, if we have an increase in CO2, we need an increase in brain blood flow in order to wash out that toxic carbon dioxide. This is termed cerebrovascular reactivity. So if we look at this graph here, on the x-axis, we've got an increasing level of carbon dioxide. And the red line here is going to be cerebral blood flow as CO2 increases we have an increase in brain blood flow to wash it out. On the other hand, if CO2 decreases, we have a concomitant decrease in cerebral blood flow. Cerebrovascular activity is really important, and it's generally a case of the more reactive, the healthier that vessel is. So for a given increase in CO2, the more that we can increase our blood flow in the brain to wash it out, the healthier our cerebral vasculature is. Using a different mechanism now, cerebral autoregulation refers to the brain's ability to deal with changes in blood pressure. So again, if we start from neutral, if we have an increase in blood pressure here, shown here on the x-axis, we have an increase in cerebral blood flow. And equally, if we have a decrease in blood pressure, we have a decrease in cerebral blood flow. The way I find very easy to remember this is that if you've ever stood up too quickly and feel lightheaded, that's because we very quickly lowered our blood pressure and in turn we have a decrease in cerebral blood flow. So just moving forward, cerebral reactivity, all to do with carbon dioxide, autoregulation, all to do with um, blood pressure. Okay, so now we understand the anatomy, a bit about how it's regulated and what the important terms are. Why should we bother studying cerebral blood pressure? I think Bert made this point really well in his presentation. It's always important to, to tell everyone why this is an important area of study. So in young adults, uh, many of us I'm sure on this call are young, healthy adults, resting cerebral blood flow is inversely correlated with cognitive function. So to flip that sentence around, the people with the higher levels of cerebral blood flow pay better attention and are better at performing cognitive challenging tasks. That's a good thing. So we're already starting to get an idea that we want to be able to promote blood flow, especially even at a young age. On top of that, as we get older, we know that brain blood flow decreases. So CBF stands for cerebral blood flow. We know that it decreases and that this mirrors decreases in cognitive function. So the two appear to be linked. Lower cerebral blood flow. So in, this is now talking about adulthood and slightly older age. If we have a lower level of brain blood flow, 
it's associated with cognitive decline and an increased risk of dementia. Um, and dementia um, is obviously very costly um, as a disease and again forms an example of a cerebrovascular disease that is that is preventable and non-communicable and I refer you back to Bert's talk where he talks about the issues of cardiovascular disease um, in terms of the global burden and cost. And finally cerebrovascular reactivity um, uh, which was that test in the challenge of CO2. So this is associated with Alzheimer's, declines in cognitive function and dementia. So we start to see that if we have an impairment in our ability of our cerebrovasculature to respond to changes in CO2, this is linked with pretty pretty big diseases, and in the case of dementia and Alzheimer's, pretty big killers once we get into older age. And finally, cerebrovascular activity is also predictive of stroke. Um, and again, stroke falls into that category of cardiovascular disease, which is the biggest um, killer of non-communicable disease worldwide. So from this slide, let's appreciate it's important to promote cerebral blood flow and it's important to promote cerebrovascular reactivity in order to diminish the risk um, associated with those things. Like I say, it makes sense to try and promote cerebral blood flow. And this model was um, presented just a couple of years ago in, in a really strong journal. And this shows the potential interactions between lifestyle cerebral blood flow and cognitive performance. And in terms of the premise for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the physical exercise side of things. So I'm not here to talk about dietary factors. That's not the scope of my PhD. I'm an exercise physiologist. I'm interested in what we can do physically to try and increase our cerebrovascular function and increase our cerebral blood flow. So these two red circles really form the premise of the lecture today. I'll then touch on a link between cerebral blood flow and cognitive performance. So I think that's really interesting. I think that's Often an accessible link for an audience um, to, to think about. The second half of the talk, very quickly, we'll just go through what happens if we remove physical exercise and then the subsequent impact that has on cerebral blood flow, function, and cognitive performance. I've spoken a lot about adults, but you know, I'm part of the Children's Health and Exercise Research Centre in Exeter, um, and my PhD is studying cerebral blood flow in children and adolescents. So what is it about children and adolescents that are different? And again, why is it important to study? So everything we've touched on so far has been in adults. Cerebral blood flow in youth. So these graphs that I'm showing now, very complicated, lots of data, but they all have a measurement of age on the x-axis and a measurement of cerebral blood flow through different techniques, mostly through the MRI, which is our gold standard of resting cerebral blood flow. So we can see in all of these studies, the highest levels of cerebral blood flow appear around eight to 10, around 10 years, around 10 years of age, okay? So this evidence shows us that cerebral blood flow peaks in childhood. And in fact, the levels of cerebral blood flow in some cases are twice that in a child than an adult. And we've got evidence now showing that cerebral blood flow increases to around the age of seven to 10 years, rapidly decreases during adolescence, and then maintains adult levels till around the age of 40 to 50, where it then declines more into older age. And the reasons for this higher cerebral blood flow observed in youth um, is due to the greater metabolic requirements of the developing brain. So obviously, as we grow and develop, we're going to have um, rapid myelination of the nerves in our brain. We're going to have the brain growing in size and developing in structure. And this elevated blood flow delivery to the brain is there to support that. So as we progress from a child through adolescence, so this is the period of puberty before, before we reach adulthood, there are important changes in resting cerebral blood flow and in cerebrovascular reactivity which are different to both children and adults and make adolescents a really unique group to study. So here's the graph here, and we can see that during the period of adolescence, we see a rapid decrease in cerebral blood flow from child levels, adult levels. Alongside that, we see an increase in cerebrovascular reactivity. So this y axis here shows how reactive and healthy those vessels are. We see a trend in increase around the age of 15 where it peaks and then appears to decline into adulthood. So, We've got children with high levels of brain blood flow, but low levels of reactivity. We've got adolescents who experience this fall in brain blood flow, but this increase in reactivity. And then we've got adulthood where both seem to deteriorate. Fundamentally, these papers are very recent and the mechanisms behind these and our understandings of these are, are quite poor at the moment. And this forms a really, really new area to study. And this is kind of where my PhD um, slots in. So the main challenges of studying cerebral blood flow in children and adolescents I found is that there are very few studies in children and adolescents compared to adults. So in general, the regulation of brain blood in adults is quite well appreciated, but in children, it's received very, very limited research. And on top of that, cerebral blood flow in children and adolescents is difficult to study because there have been more studies done 
on peripheral arterial function. So that, that links into Birch talk. To the extent that the topic, the title of my talk was the effect of physical inactivity on cerebral blood flow in youth. And there is not one study that has studied that question explicitly. So we can see we're entering a really new area where there is limited research. So moving forward, I just want you to appreciate I'm going to combine some adult evidence and some child evidence to try and paint a clearer picture as possible. But also please appreciate that this is a very, very important and a very, very growing area and a real opportunity um, for research moving forward. And like Bert said, if you guys wanted to come to Exeter and, and perhaps study, this is certainly a, an area that's moving forward at quite a rate. And we have the capacity to measure brain blood flow in children and to perform some interventions. So first place point, limited studies compared to adults. So why does that matter? So in children, we know that we have higher levels of resting brain blood flow. And a greater percentage of blood gets delivered to the child's brain compared to an adult. So that 15% that I mentioned earlier in adults is an even greater percentage in childhood. So the brain has a higher level of blood flow and more of our body's blood as a percentage is going to the brain when we're a child. On top of that, I've already presented some data through puberty where we have increases and then decreases in the reactivity of those vessels. And as a child, the oxygen consumption in the brain is also elevated. So that ties in perhaps with the resting levels of cerebral blood flow. Also during puberty, we have increases in neural development. We have more glucose metabolism and a, and a higher demand of the brain as we go through puberty, which obviously is going to differ to an adult. And finally, the regulation of these processes, so like I mentioned, carbon dioxide earlier perhaps, um, appears to be very different in children, adolescents, adults, not only at rest, but also during exercise. So taken collectively, and a key message, I think, from the start of this presentation, we cannot assume that a child is simply a small adult because there are countless differences in the child's brain and the regulation of its flow compared to an adult. Going back here, we've covered the limited studies compared to adults. So what about this relationship between you know, our brain function, our brain blood flow function, and our peripheral arterial function? To build on Bert's presentation, there's only been one study that's compared changes in cerebral blood flow regulation and changes in peripheral blood flow regulation. So on this graph here, we've got our overnight change in FMD. So the FMD was that um, the measure that Bert presented that is the reactivity of our peripheral vessels. And here on the x-axis, we've got the change in our cerebral vessels. And what this graph shows quite nicely is that changes in cerebral vascular function and peripheral vascular function appear to be related. So from that statement, you could say, well, Max, this is a pointless presentation because everything we know in the periphery could extend to the cerebral vasculature if indeed they're related. Again, this exists only in adults and has not been studied in children. And in fact, it's only been presented once here. And I would question perhaps the strength of this relationship. As we can see, this small section up here, the relationship between the two appears to be quite negligible and seems to be pulled by the range of data down here. From this one study conducted now in 2007, it's not crystal clear that indeed changes in peripheral function and cerebrovascular function are related. And there's a clear need to study them separately moving forward before we even consider the importance of studying children and adults. Just going back to the presentation structure, I'm going to be talking here about a two-sided coin. So the first is the benefits that come with exercise and physical activity, not just in childhood, but I'll also present some adult data. And then on the flip side, I'll present what happens when we remove this and in conditions perhaps of quarantine related to coronavirus. What happens when we experience a lack of exercise and physical activity? The first thing I'll present is some chronic data looking at aerobic fitness and cerebral blood flow in the context of aging. What this graph shows here is age on the x-axis and MCAV, so this is cerebral blood flow velocity, remember that's a surrogate of brain blood flow, across age. And this green arrow shows us quite clearly that as we get older, cerebral blood flow decreases. Remembering this mirrors declines in cognitive function, which in turn is a risk factor for dementia and Alzheimer's. First point, we get older, cerebral blood flow decreases. Second thing we'll see here is that they've separated these lines for those adults that were endurance trained, shown in the white circles with the red line, compared to those who are sedentary, shown in the black circles with the blue line. And what we can see is across age, so from teenage years all the way up until you're 80, if you have a high level of endurance training, you have higher levels of cerebral blood flow, which is a good thing because we know that low levels of brain blood flow are related to disease risk and cognitive decline. This study a few years later, took it one further, and they actually performed correlations between VO2 max. So VO2 max is our gold standard measurement of aerobic fitness. 
and again, cerebral blood flow here. This is in a sample of young people. So in young adults, we can see that the greater the VO2 max, the greater the fitness level, the greater the levels of brain blood flow. They also did this in a sample of older adults and found the same thing. So from this slide, the information we're getting is if you have a higher VO2 max, you have a higher level of brain blood flow, regardless of whether you're young or whether you're old. Okay, what about blood vessel functions? That's just a measure of blood flow. We know that actually it was the cerebrovascular reactivity that was the predictor of stroke and dementia. In young adults here, we've changed the x-axis now. It's now our measure of cerebrovascular reactivity, how healthy those blood vessels are. And again, we can see that there is a really strong, significant correlation between higher fitness levels and higher reactivity of our brain, brain blood flow vessels. Again, this holds true in older adults. So greater aerobic fitness is not only associated with higher levels of cerebral blood flow, but those higher levels of cerebral blood flow are able to react more to changes in carbon dioxide, which is a sign of health. And this study was the final one I'll present on this question. Um, so they used an estimated measurement of cardiorespiratory fitness. And again, they found the same as the other studies. Again, we've got global cerebral blood flow here. So this is in an MRI scanner, so the gold standard measurement. And they found higher levels of fitness were associated with higher levels of brain blood flow. And they found that greater age was inversely associated with blood flow. So if you have higher fitness and a younger age, you have higher levels of brain blood flow than if you're low fitness and, lo and high age. And they did some statistical analyses and they found that the effects of age were more or less all explained by differences in cardiorespiratory fitness. So this suggests that cardiorespiratory fitness mediated the negative effect of age on cerebral blood flow and points to us promoting cerebral um, cardiorespiratory fitness in order to promote cerebral blood flow. I just wanted to provide my first quick summary. So a greater level of fitness is associated with higher cerebral blood flow in adults. This is another question, well, what about in children? So we know in children, we already have a higher level of brain blood flow. Does this relationship with fitness still exist? So I just wanted to quickly point out a specific region of the brain that was performed in this study. So this is the hippocampus. So it's located just in the bottom of the brainstem, the posterior circulation of the brain, and it's responsible for learning and memory. And this study a few years ago now took 73 primary school children and they use an MRI to measure blood flow in this particular region of the brain. And the reason they use this particular region of the brain is because it's to do with learning and memory, which obviously is massive importance in childhood and the school years. Stuff isn't very clear at all, so I've just added on my own axis. So again, on the x-axis, we've got increasing levels of aerobic fitness. And on the y-axis, we've got increasing levels of blood flow in this particular region of the brain. Again, we can see this positive relationship where higher levels of fitness in children are associated with higher levels of blood flow in the hippocampus. Greater aerobic fitness was related to greater blood flow in this region of the brain. Interestingly, they measured blood flow in a different region of the brain, which wasn't to do with learning and memory and found no relationship. And another strength of this study was that they controlled for different ages, sexes, and the volume of this region of the brain. So we're confident that it's aerobic fitness that has this association with the blood flow. So just wanted to revisit that summary. What about in children who already have higher levels of cerebral blood flow? Yes, there is still this relationship where greater fitness is associated with greater blood flow, but it may be more region specific and not global cerebral blood flow, but instead related to these centers um, of memory and learning. Okay, just changing tack slightly, and we're going to move away from fitness and we're going to move now into physical activity. So two obviously very different concepts that aren't always necessarily indicating the same thing. In children, um, a higher level of physical activity is associated with better academic performance. We know in a, in, a, in a classroom, those children that engage in more physical activity inside and outside of school perform better academically. We also know that they um, have better attention and spend more time on task, have better memory, they have better executive function, so that's the ability to sort of problem solve and, and perform challenging cognitive tasks, and they have fewer mistakes when performing these tasks. So this is only observational, but it, for me, it indicates some really important data in terms of cognitive function, that actually the children that are physically active likely have a higher blood flow to the brain, but also in terms of, in terms of behavior and function, we're seeing better performance, fewer mistakes, and alongside better memory and, and executive function. So what about the brain structure and function? What are the benefits here of physical activity? So in children, 
higher physical activity is associated with greater brain volumes in these regions, as well as greater blood flow in these regions. So again, here's the region of the brain related to um, sort of memory and learning. And we know that the children who are more physically active have a greater level of brain blood flow and a greater volume of that part of the brain. We're also better able to switch on parts of the brain um, required for higher level thinking, and that's come from some really neat studies done in an MRI scanner. And finally, they have better um, ability to learn and perform motor skills um, and have better self-regulation. So this shows that physical activity not only has improvements in the structure and function of the brain and promoting brain blood flow, but it also has um, subsequent benefits in cognitive and motor abilities. So from these first two summaries, increases in fitness associated with greater blood flow in the brain and increases in physical activity associated with improvements in structure, function, and performance capabilities in children. Okay, so this leads me quite nicely on to what happens with acute exercise. So the models we've presented so far are all in relation to um, habitual levels of physical activity or measurements that are more chronic, such as that of aerobic fitness. So what happens if we get children, school children, to perform a single bout of exercise? So this study, um, 10 years ago, took 20 prepubertal children um, and performed just 20 minutes of moderate intensity walking on a treadmill. And they measured cognitive function and, and did some academic tasks before exercise and about 25 minutes after. Here's the result. They measured loads of different things, but I just want to point out a few key findings. The first here, after exercise, there was a massive, significant increase in reading comprehension for these children. This came alongside reduced reaction time, so there were faster reactions, and also a greater accuracy of their responses. So this suggests that a single bout of exercise can promote um, cognitive function and academic capabilities in children. And the interesting question from here is, well, is this to do with cerebral blood flow? But on top of that, um, I just want to present a few other studies just so that I'm not presenting just one interesting paper. So we know that morning physical activity improves selective attention in school children. Um, we know that after a PE class, attention and concentration increase. Um, and we know that when physical activity lessons, just short ones, a couple per day, just minutes were delivered, kids were able to have more time on task during school. So this clearly points to evidence that regular physical activity or even one acute bout of physical activity can improve cognitive function. And the question I ask is, is this to do with changes in brain blood flow? So we're obviously seeing some benefit from exercise. Is that to do with what happens to brain blood flow during exercise? But this hasn't been studied in children. So that's, that's a limitation of the research presented so far. Have reported these improvements following exercise, but we don't know whether that's to do with anything that happens inside the brain in terms of blood flow. There's early evidence in adults suggested that these changes in cognitive function after exercise are related to brain blood flow. But last month, or a couple of months ago, now end of May, um, a recent study was published suggesting that any benefit of cognitive function following exercise aren't related to changes in cerebral blood flow or blood flow velocity. So that kind of threw a bit of spanner in the works. So exercise has a benefit on cognitive function, but perhaps the mechanism isn't through cerebral blood flow. In fact, interestingly, recent work by Christine over in um, UBC, the University of British Columbia, found actually that following a bout of moderate intensity exercise or a bout of high intensity interval exercise, that actually we observed a decrease in cerebral blood flow after exercise. So maybe this confuses the picture a little bit further. We finish exercise and cerebral blood flow is lower, but cognitive function is increased. So perhaps the two aren't related. I just wanted to present this data to further add to the picture that actually what happens to brain blood flow during and after exercise in children is actually quite poorly understood. Final summary in terms of exercise. So key exercise benefits cognitive function, memory and academic performance, but it remains unclear if this is strictly to do with elevations or changes in cerebral blood flow that occur during or after exercise. And for me, this remains a really important area for future research. Is the during or post-exercise response in brain blood flow having an impact on these benefits we see after exercise? this opportunity to make a natural link into sort of my own PhD. So my PhD study um, is looking at what happens to brain blood flow during exercise in children, adolescents and adults. So this is a meta-analysis. So what a meta-analysis does, it combines all the available studies shown here on the right-hand side. And this looks at what happens to brain blood flow on the y-axis across exercise intensity on the x-axis. 
And the first thing we'll see is that as we progress from rest through to moderate intensity exercise, we see an increase in brain blood flow. Really interestingly, almost paradoxically, we see then as we progress to higher intensity exercise, a decrease in cerebral blood flow. This might seem really interesting, but actually the higher levels of cerebral blood flow observed during moderate intensity exercise, even though when we're exercising maximally, the requirements of the brain are much higher. This has puzzled researchers for a little time, but what they found in adults is that what these numbers here represent is um, basically is called PET CO2. So this is end tidal carbon dioxide, and it represents the CO2 levels that are circulating in our blood. And what we see is that brain blood flow, shown by the red arrows, follows changes in CO2 by the numbers very closely. So we see an increase in CO2 and brain blood flow to moderate intensity exercise. And then as it gets harder, we see a decrease to exhaustion. This is because we start to hyperventilate as we go from moderate to maximum exercise. And if we hyperventilate, we're blowing off a lot more CO2. And in turn, we think that that's why brain blood flow goes down in adults. So it's an interesting picture. But like I say, moderate intensity exercise is thought to elicit the greatest increases in cerebral blood flow, um, at least in adults. So the key thing from this meta-analysis here, this is presented only adult data and has only been studied once before in children. So what about in children? Here I'm going to present some of my PhD data. So here in the grey circles, so again, just read this x-axis, never mind about the landmarks, this x-axis represents exercise intensity. So we've got rest, we've kind of got moderate intensity exercise here in the middle, and we've got maximal intensity exercise here at the end. And again, the y-axis here is changes in brain blood flow or middle cerebral artery velocity. And what we can see here is in children, shown in the grey circles, we see a smaller increase, only around 10% in brain blood flow, whereas adolescents and adults have about a 25% increase in brain blood flow. In children, we see smaller increases in cerebral blood flow during exercise. And this is, again, quite poorly understood, and perhaps it could be due to their higher levels of resting cerebral blood flow, or perhaps there are mechanisms in place to protect the developing brain from overperfusion, from too much blood flow. But also the question I ask myself with my study is, well, is this due to differences in regulation of the brain blood flow? We know from the previous study that CO2 and brain blood flow followed each other very closely in adults. But is this the case in children? So this graph here is, again, from, from my PhD study, and it looks quite complicated. But read the x-axis. This is changes in CO2, and the y-axis is changes in um, cerebral blood flow. And each line represents a participant. When you see a black line, that shows that changes in CO2 and brain blood flow were significantly and strongly related. And we can see that in 90% of our adult sample, we saw a strong relationship between CO2 and brain blood flow. When we studied the adolescents, the number of people that had this significant relationship reduced to just over half. And in our children, there were only a few children who observed this significant relationship. More adults have a strong relationship between MCAV, the middle cerebral artery blood velocity, and CO2 than adolescents, and more adolescents than children. And also, if we look at the average strength of this relationship, we can see so this is an R value. So an R value of 0.6 is, is moderate to strong. We can see the strength of the relationship is greatest in adults, weaker in adolescents, and very weak, almost non-existent in children. So importantly, what this suggests is that the role of carbon dioxide on brain blood flow appears to increase with age. To the extent in adults, it appears to be a very strong regulatory mechanism, but in children, it appears to have a very minimal role in regulating brain blood flow. So my fourth summary, children experience smaller changes in brain blood flow during exercise, and the role of carbon dioxide on this response appears to weaken as we get younger. And ultimately, from that last slide that I presented, brain blood flow appears to be regulated differently in children, adolescents, and adults. And again, this for me, this is where I'm taking my PhD, and this is an area that is really poorly understood and requires future research in order to understand the maturation and the development of the brain, brain blood flow, um, and how it's regulated during exercise and even at rest. So just revisiting my presentation structure, I've just covered off exercise and physical activity and some of the benefits and what happens during and after exercise. I'm just going to spend the last five minutes, it's not going to be long, um, going through what happens if we remove physical activity or exercise at some of the potential risks. So this is from the paper that Bert presented, um, and this is data from China. And you know, alarmingly, the impact of COVID-19 on the behavior on children, adolescents, lifestyle is, is much larger than expected. I'm just going to present the same table that Bert did and draw our attention to physical activity. 
So we can see that on average, children are doing 435 minutes less physical activity per week, which is alarming. Um, and the number of people that are inactive has increased by 44%. So we're facing a pandemic, not only like Bert said, from the actual coronavirus, but we're seeing a physical activity pandemic as well. And what could the effect of this be on cerebral blood flow? Why, to, why is sedentary behavior important in the context of the brain and, and brain blood flow? So sedentary behavior is associated with poorer cognitive function. Um, and I thought that reducing and replacing this kind of behavior um, could protect against cognitive decline and promote brain blood flow. Again, sedentary time is detrimental for brain blood flow independently of physical activity. And sedentary aging increases the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. So hopefully this presents a quick rationale why it's important to consider what happens to brain blood flow in the context of being sedentary. So the first question, what happens if we stop exercise? So this study a few years ago in Journal of Aging Neuroscience took 20 master's athletes with more than 15 years of endurance training. So master's athletes are older aged adults um, who have been training endurance for 15 years. And they just told them to stop exercising for 10 days. And they use an MRI scanner to measure cerebral blood flow. So these people have been exercising for a very, very long time. And they're only stopping activity for 10 days. And um, both in the left and the right hand side of the brain, they observed a very significant decrease in cerebral blood flow after just 10 days. So this suggests that no matter how habitual our exercise was entering the global pandemic, if we've undergone a period of quarantine where we've significantly reduced our um, physical activity and our training, we could be experiencing a reduction in cerebral blood flow. And let's not forget that lower cerebral blood flow um, is a risk for dementia um, and stroke moving forward. What about acutely? Um, that was obviously a, a long-term model. What happens if we are sedentary? So this study by um, Carter and colleagues uh, published a couple of years ago took 15 adult death workers and got them to perform three different conditions that involved four hours of sitting, or four hours of sitting where they walked for two minutes every half hour, or they walked for eight minutes for every two hours. So these were matched for total walking time. They measured the change in cerebral blood flow velocity after, before and after the four hours. This is a complicated looking graph, I know. So we're gonna look here on the y-axis This is our measure of cerebral blood flow. And here are our three different conditions. The first thing we'll see is after four hours of sitting, there was a significant reduction in brain blood flow. So if you sit there for four hours and don't move, we see an acute reduction in brain blood flow, which is bad. We also see that if you walked every two hours, you still saw this reduction in brain blood flow. However, the benefit came, or the maintenance of cerebral blood flow was seen in this condition here, where you're performing two minutes of walking every 30 minutes. This is a really important finding because it suggests that there's not only an important role of exercise, um, but also an important role of exercise frequency. Walking every two hours wasn't sufficient to promote brain blood flow, but where we did it every 30 minutes, it was. So the message from this paper is take regular but short walking breaks from your desk work and you can maintain your cerebral blood flow. Support this study, um, a study a year later, took 21 working adults and observed a midday dip in cerebral blood flow shown here um, after prolonged sitting. But this second condition shown here by the circles alternated sitting and standing every 30 minutes and found that the reduction in brain blood flow that occurred in the middle of the day was no longer significant if we alternate the sitting and standing every 30 minutes. So again, there are clear benefits of breaking up prolonged sitting for cerebral blood flow. And it appears that the frequency of these is perhaps more important than the volume. To follow a logical question, well, what happens if we exercise before we do the sitting? Are we protected? So this study took 67 overweight and obese adults and got them to sit eight hours this time. Or got them to sit eight hours after they'd done a moderate intensity walking bout or got them to sit for eight hours after moderate intensity walking about whilst breaking up the sitting time. So they've combined all three different options there. What they found was in the X and sit condition, so that's where um, moderate intensity walking was performed before sitting, cerebral blood flow was preserved. Okay, so if you exercise first thing in the morning and then sit for eight hours, cerebral blood flow was pres preserved relative to just sitting. And also interestingly, executive function, cognitive function over the eight hour day was improved if morning exercise was performed. Just to provide a very quick summary, a reduction in physical activity um, 
acutely or chronically results in a reduced brain blood flow in adults. So let's not forget the evidence I've presented so far is just in adults. And also exercising before prolonged sitting and breaking up the sitting time frequently are effective at mitigating this reduction in cerebral blood flow. Last thing I'm going to present, I appreciate my 45 minutes is almost up. Um, so what about in youth? What happens in, in childhood? So this is a study done um, by a master's student in Exeter. Um, Bert presented some of the peripheral data. I'm going to present some of the cerebrovascular data. So we took 21 adolescents around about 14 years old, and we measured cerebrovascular function, cerebrovascular reactivity first thing in the morning. We then gave the kids either a sugary drink or in the control condition, we gave them water. They sat down for an hour, did some work, played some Xbox, before we measured cerebrovascular activity again. An hour after that, we fed them a high-fat challenge meal, and then three hours later measured their cerebrovascular reactivity. Quite a complex experimental setup. But what we see here is in the control condition, where they've just drank water, we have an hour opportunity of prolonged sitting, not necessarily prolonged, an hour of sitting, where we can see what happens to cerebral blood flow. By taking that data from the control condition, we've looked at their baseline middle cerebral artery velocity. They had a glass of water, and we measured them an hour later. And we also observed a significant decrease in middle cerebral artery blood flow velocity. The one hour sitting reduced cerebral blood flow velocity in these adolescents. But we also had measures of their reactivity, of their function. So what happened there? So this here, again, we've got baseline, we've got after they've drunk a drink, and they've got after they've had the high-fat challenge meal, and we've got our cerebrovascular reactivity shown here on the y-axis, and no change occurred. So there's no change in cerebrovascular reactivity in adolescents following the consumption of any sugary drink, consumption of a high-fat meal, or after a period of sitting. So this would suggest that cerebrovascular adolescents appear to be protected against these challenges. So although we saw a reduction in baseline flow after an hour of sitting, the actual ability of these vessels to react to changes in CO2 were predicted. Final summary, evidence is really limited. Um, and in fact, the aim of this study wasn't to explore the benefit of sitting or the risk of sitting. But it looks as though MCAV could be reduced after sitting in children. But the reactivity of these vessels appear to be quite well preserved following either a nutritional challenge in the form of a sugary drink or a high fat meal or after a small period of sitting. But ultimately, the conclusion here is that more research is needed. I just want to say thank you all for listening. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'm going to send it back to Ricardo and Bert and I are going to collectively answer any questions together. I just want to take this opportunity to thank the Quect Institute for funding my PhD, Cranbrook Education Campus, a, a lovely school in Devon who provided a lot of brilliant participants to me. Um, I'd like to thank Ricardo for the opportunity and obviously Bert for being a great supervisor and, and getting me here today. So thank you for listening, everybody, um, and we'll go through some questions.